Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Hog for him, Sameach. Hog for him, Sameach. As of tonight. I titled the drosh, Resisting the Usurper, and I've done a number of sermons on Purim, so over time it goes, okay, what new aspect can I talk about? So I've talked about why didn't Mordecai bow, I've talked about different, different things around it, I've talked about Esther's struggle and, and the position she was put in and all kinds of things. So if you're not familiar with the story of Purim, if you haven't read the Megillah through 50,000 times, then we'll do a quick little sprint through the high points of the story. So Esther chapter 1, we're introduced to uh, King Ahasuerus, which is thought to be King Xerxes, or possibly Artaxerxes in Persia. And he's having a grand party, half a year of binge drinking, basically. And in that time, uh, he's celebrating all the royal victories. And he asks for his queen, Vashti, to be brought to him. And it's implied that she was to be brought to him wearing her crown, and only her crown. Uh, She refused, and so she was immediately banished. The king in chapter 2 decides to get a new queen, so he sends throughout the entire empire to find the most beautiful women, and uh, Hadassah, but her Persian name Esther is chosen. We're introduced to Mordecai, her most likely cousin, uh, and Esther. So he tells her, don't reveal that you're Jewish while you're in the court. At the end of chapter 2, Mordecai, who is... He's a ranking palace official, reveals the plot of Bigthan and Teresh to assassinate King Ahasuerus. So he overhears the plot, realizes what they're doing, reports it, and Queen Esther gives Mordecai credit for saving his life. Chapter 3, we're introduced to Haman. There is this kind of odd uh, palace culture, so to speak, that Everyone is bowing to Haman. Now, normally you would bow to a king. That's, that's a normal thing. And in scripture, we see people bowing to each other. Abraham bowed to people. It's, it's a sign of respect, not necessarily worship. It's all about context. But everyone's bowing to Haman, and he's not the king. This is very strange. And Mordecai refuses. So Haman does the rational thing to him and decides to kill all the Jewish people. Chapter 4, Esther uh, is approached on what's going on because of the, the plot. She agrees to help Mordecai. She fasts for three days. Chapter 5, she goes to the king and asks him to go to a banquet. She doesn't immediately ask him for for help and tell him what's going on. In this time, Haman decides, man, I'm being elevated. I'm being invited to to banquets with Queen Esther and the king, so I'm going to go build gallows to hang Mordecai on. Chapter 6, he goes to the king, asks for permission to hang Mordecai. And instead, the king says, hey, I found out there's this person that I didn't honor who saved my life. Mordecai, give him a parade. Chapter 7, there is a second banquet. It is revealed that Haman is trying to kill all the Jews. Haman is hanged. In chapter 8, Mordecai is elevated. There's a decree saying the Jewish people can defend themselves. There is an interesting thing that's often glossed over. There is this little bit at the end of effectively a second parade because Mordecai left the king's presence dresses the king, and went out among the people. Chapter 9, there's a big fight. They kill a bunch of people who are trying to kill them. Many people convert and become Jewish throughout the Persian Empire. And then chapter 10 is three verses, and it talks about the greatest of, the greatness of Mordecai. Haman was a usurper. He was not the king. Yet he insisted on people bowing to him. Years ago, in a, in a job, I had... Someone in another department who technically would, let's say, outrank me, but he was not in my chain of command. And he was demanding I go do certain work. And so I told him, well, I'm not the one who, I don't get my taskings from you. And I was willing to play ball, but once he realized I wasn't going to acquiesce to his every demand, he starts yelling at me on the phone um, about how I had to do what he said. Uh, So I did the mature thing and hung up on him. Uh, and, and really, when someone tries to present themselves as a usurper, when they're trying to say, hey, I'm in charge of you, when in fact they're not, ignoring them is often the smartest move. If you try to engage, you're going to get dragged down to their level. So this person had no real authority over me. 
except what I was willing to let him have. And Esther chapter 3. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. But Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. Now the literal Hebrew there is not uh, is for the king had commanded him. The concerning is kind of inserted, it's implied. For the king had commanded him. This reeks, this is not an official, uh, if this is an official decree or law, why does Haman not pursue legal action? For example, if I'm speeding 20 miles an hour over the limit and a police officer sees me, he pulls me over and writes me a ticket. He doesn't start stalking me for six months to destroy me. Laws are something you enforce through a legal code. This has the appearance of an unenforceable executive order. It has the appearance, once everyone starts going along with an unenforceable executive order, you can go to the next slide, of group think. When people start going along with something that's not really law, it's not really legal, but it seeps into the culture and everyone just kind of goes crazy with something. Next slide. Be the guy in the circle. This is at a Nazi rally. And everyone is going along with what the Nazi party is saying. Except the one guy. And he is surrounded by people doing the Hitler salute. Be that guy. There is a lot of social pressure when you are that guy. There is oftentimes seemingly a lot of persecution when you are that guy. A note on that guy, before you get too excited, that does not mean you're a contrarian. It doesn't mean that whenever you see someone, everyone doing a certain thing, that you decide you're going to do the opposite. For example, if you're new to a synagogue service, it's not, this is not the person who says, oh, you're bowing at this spot in the Matovu? Well, maybe I don't want to. Maybe I want to bow, oh, we stand when the Torah is up? Maybe I don't want to. That's called being a jerk. <laughs> being a contrarian is very different from being what Mordecai was doing. If he was breaking an actual rule, he would have been arrested and charged. An interesting thing, when persecution like this arises, when these kinds of things happen, the rabbis have an interesting note on this in Megillah uh, 13b. The verse describes when the rest of the events of the Megillah occurred. After these events, did King Ahasuerus promote Haman? And that's in chapter 3, verse 1. The Gemara asks, after what particular events? Rabbi said, only after the Holy One, blessed be he, created a remedy for the blow and set in place the chain of events that would lead to the miraculous salvation was Haman appointed setting the stage for the decree against the Jews to be issued. Before we are ever introduced to Haman, he doesn't come in the story until chapter 3. Who do we meet? We meet Esther. We meet Mordecai. Esther becomes queen, and the king owes Mordecai his life. Before we ever meet Haman, before we encounter struggles and tribulations and trials, no matter how dark they look, God has already created the source for your salvation. What does it say in Revelation 13, 8? The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Before there was even sin, God had a way. When we approach problems as if there's just no solution, we are walking not in faith, but in fear. Before your problem arises, God already has a plan. He who fears is not made perfect in love. Before you were aware of the issue at hand, before any of the events of your lifetime happened, before your struggles, whether something we've gone through as a nation or something in your individual life, God already placed the elements there to bring you through it. When we act out of fear and uncertainty and doubt, it leads us to sin. We read about it in the Haftar today. Saul feared the people. And it led him to sin, to do exactly what he knew he was not supposed to do. 
That's the summary of the drush. We're going to hit some items quickly. So maybe uh, poke the person next to you. And if you zone out, you're probably going to get lost. So commenting on Mordecai's refusal, the rabbis have an interesting note in Esther Rabbah. The Rabbah commentary is uh, a 5th century commentary that codified a, a bunch of different midrash from a, a couple centuries prior. They say the children of Rachel, their miracles are equal and their ascent to greatness is equal. Rachel had two children, Joseph and Benjamin. What about these people do we see in common? So Joseph, not much is written on Benjamin. But Joseph, we have a lot written about Joseph. So think about what maybe Mordecai and Joseph have in common here. It says, now it came to, in Esther 3, 4, it came to pass when they said this to him daily, he did not heed them. They told this to Haman to see whether the Mordecai's words would stand. So they came to him day after day, getting him to do something that he's not supposed to do, going along with a usurper. What does this remind us of? Perhaps Joseph in Potiphar's household when he's being pursued by Potiphar's wife, when he had said, I am like Potiphar in every way but one. I am over his house. I am over his wealth. I am over his servants. I am over all of his stuff. I am, in tr- I am like him in every way except one. I am not, I have no rights to his wife. 39, Genesis 39.10. Now it came about when she, Potiphar, spoke to Joseph day in and day out that he did not obey her to lie beside her and to be with her. Take a look. If you think I'm just drawing loose connections, take a look in the next slide at how closely it lines up. Vayhi Kamran versus Vayhi Kavara. Yom, 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 Yom. Velo Shema, Aleha. It's the same wording that we see. So we see Mordecai having this similar struggle where someone is trying to play a usurper, or get him to play a usurper. We see he's being pursued, yom yom, day after day, that this keeps happening. Mordecai, like Joseph centuries prior, passed the test, endured some hardship along the way, but was ultimately elevated to second in command of the nation. We see these parallel stories going along, both of them sons of Rachel. The matriarch Rachel had two children, Joseph and Benjamin, and Joseph passed the test. Benjamin was never tested. We don't read a lot about Benjamin. Joseph required large amounts of wisdom, discernment, self-control, and leadership to overcome his trials. And we see a similar thing in Mordecai. But why did it take so long to get there? There's a lot of scripture and a lot of history between Joseph's story and Mordecai. So there was someone we kind of missed. Saul, child of Rachel, a very significant Benjamite. Saul, the son of Kish. Saul failed a number of significant tests. He did not wait for Samuel to offer sacrifices, but instead does it himself. Saul became jealous of David and attempted to kill him multiple times, both directly and indirectly. Saul seeks the assistance of a witch instead of seeking God. Saul repeatedly demonstrated poor leadership and an unwillingness to see a situation through. And lastly, and most relevant to us here today, and Purim, Saul refused to kill Agag, king of the Amalekites. Why? Saul feared the people. Now, Saul's story serves as a cautionary tale to us. We read in 1 Samuel 10 that God's spirit had come upon Saul And he went and prophesied. He had all these wonderful experiences. And he spent a significant amount of time under Samuel's tutelage. And yet, he stumbled and failed. That should be a very cautionary tale to many of us. Because your success in your walk, you cannot point back to a time that you were spirit-filled. You cannot point back to a time that you had a great mentor or a great teacher. It is about your relationship with God, always now. But what about Saul specifically? What what led him, a 
astray. There's an interesting note on that, because I always wondered, why, why did he refuse to kill Agag? It's odd. It was, it was a very straightforward, clear-cut thing that he was asked to do, and he didn't do it. So what, what happened? There's a story about that regarding Doeg the Edomite. He's formally introduced in 1 Samuel 21 after those events as the chief of Saul's shepherds. And the way he's introduced is he observed David going to see Ahimelech the priest, reports it to Saul later, and it ends up in Doeg killing Ahimelech, 85 priests, and the entire city of Nob. Uh, Doeg is a very evil man. The sages refer to Doeg as actually an expert in Torah and the head of Saul's Sanhedrin. Yet an appalling and morally obtuse man because you have to have a relationship with God if you are going to keep Torah the way God wants you to. He had no relationship whatsoever. And because of that, he could twist Torah to be whatever he wanted it to be. How do you deceive a spirit-filled man? You mix it with truth, and you do your absolute best to deceive it. The best lies have a lot of truth mixed in. In Midrash Tehillim, he, Doeg the Edomite, forbade the shedding of Agog's blood to Saul. And he said to him, it is written in the Torah, you shall not slaughter an animal and its offspring on the same day. And yet you're going to kill young and old, infants and women, all in one day? God forbid. How could God have told you to do that? The Torah says not to. If you're going to deceive someone, you've got to mix it with some truth. Saul failed the test because he did not have discernment, because he lacked judgment. He failed the similar test of temptation along with the test of discernment, which Joseph had passed. And many of us know the rest of Saul's story. And from there, the child of Rachel failed the test where Joseph succeeded. And generation after generation goes by. And God says in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, inflicting the punishment of the fathers and the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. How are we introduced to Mordecai? And genealogies, by the way, they're setting the stage for the story. When we read the Bible, if I told you, for example, who my dad and my grandfather and my great-grandfather, you'd think, why are you telling me this? because it's not necessarily relevant. But when you read a genealogy in scripture, it's setting the stage for the story you're about to read. If you haven't realized that about genealogies yet, pay attention to the characters because they don't always go one generation to the next. They'll skip around to properly set the stage. You only mention generally, the general rules are men, good Jewish men, no shady characters. And you typically don't mention Gentiles. So if there's a shady character, you kind of skip over him and just don't mention him. In Esther 2, verse 5, when we're introduced to Mordecai, there was a Judean man in Shushan, the capital, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Eir, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Who is Saul the son of again? Kish. Generation 1, Shimei generation 2, Eir generation 3, Mordecai generation 4. And God says to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. The sins you do not tackle in your life, you will pass on to your children and their children and their children and their children. When you kick the can down the road, you're not just hurting yourself. You're hurting many generations down the line. So let's compare Saul to Mordecai. Mordecai is contrasted to Saul. They're both sons of Rachel from Benjamin, a descendant of Kish. Saul would not obey God. Mordecai showed devotion in the face of death. In trouble, Saul sought a witch. Well, Mordecai prayed and fasted. In killing the Agagite, Mordecai did what Saul would not. The apostle James writes, he gives... But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. 
But resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Resist the devil. When Haman was demanding, people bow to him. Did Mordecai square off with Haman and threaten to beat him up? He didn't need to. When we read resist the devil... We often think that means we need to actively engage in some sort of energetic fight. And all that leads to is you taking your focus and attention off of God and putting it somewhere else. And really, all Satan wants you to do is have your attention anywhere but God. The devil's goal is for you to not fulfill your calling. And each of us has work to do for the kingdom. So how do you resist the usurper following the successful stories of the children of Rachel, Joseph, and Mordecai through prayer, through fasting, through repentance, through faith, through relationship with God, purity and holiness, and humility? If you're lacking these things, when the usurper comes around, you will not be successful When you have someone like Doeg the Edomite twisting scripture to get you to do something you're not supposed to do, and I guarantee you, you can twist scripture to justify any stupid thing you want. If you don't have discernment, you will fail. And every generation, someone like that will arise. Sometimes multiple times. Let's combine these elements, though. Where else do we see in Scripture someone is pursued and tested by a tempter? Yom v'yom, over many days, let's say. And there is a you should bow to me implication. Where else do we have these elements and they come together? With Yeshua. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you in their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. In every other temptation, Satan quotes scripture. Why not here? He didn't directly quote scripture here. He kind of assumed a principle. A note. Satan will use scripture to your destruction if you lack discernment. He will pull on your pride or your ego or whatever sin you want to justify. And also, another note, as some of you have realized in the last several years, it's not just a, I'll give you riches and wealth. There will be many times, like Mordecai, if you don't bow, there will be a threat of death. So many of us think, oh, if the devil appeared to me offering me wealth and power, I'll say no. That's not going to be the main way it happens. Do you want to watch your family die in front of you? That's going to be the thing you're challenged with. It's interesting that Satan makes this assumption in his conversation with Yeshua that all of this is his and he'll give it to whom he wills. And it's also written in the Brahada Shah. Satan's referred to as a god and a ruler, lowercase g. He is the ultimate usurper. He usurps man because he cannot truly usurp God. Because in Genesis 1.28, God said, I've given you dominion over the fish, the birds, the air, everything that moves over the earth. But if the earth has a ruler or a lowercase g, God, Satan, then it doesn't make sense because the scripture also says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So what is it? Is the earth gods or Satan's? Who's actually in charge? Because so many of us will adopt a fatalistic view that I can't affect change because Satan's just in charge. And that is wrong. And that is a very quick way to disarm someone from doing what they're supposed to do. Who's in charge? Haman or the king? Adam and Eve gave it to Satan. Sin allows Satan to have what God gave to us. That he put in each and every one of you a piece of him. You are handmade. 
He didn't call forth man in creation. You are handmade in his image. I'm going to offend some people here, so I want you to listen to me really carefully. Rote memorization of scripture, Bible studies where you can just show how much you've learned, or sitting through a sermon and nodding along will easily put you on a path to hell. The worst thing that can possibly happen to all of you is that you hear God's word and it becomes a philosophy, but it never goes to your heart. Discernment and wisdom only come from a loving relationship with God, and that can only happen through faith. In a relationship with King Messiah, we take back what Satan stole. Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15. Read this with the story of Purim in mind. Having canceled the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Where he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him, King Messiah. Paul is addressing a number of things here, but this very much echoes the story of Purim, that a wicked decree was effectively canceled, that it was removed, and that the enemy wasn't just destroyed, they were humiliated publicly. We each have a king that we should be serving. And Yeshua has not only won, he has humiliated the enemy. The story of Purim, and God's name is never mentioned. God is never mentioned in the Megillah. It's a very unique book in that way. It is a story about when things are dark, when things seem hopeless. Don't put your faith on those things. And it's very easy to. Where you apply your focus, where you apply your attention, that is where you're applying your belief and your faith. And whenever a Haman arises, or a Pharaoh who wants to kill all the Jews, or an Antiochus who wants to kill all the Jews, or a Hitler, or anyone else, if they are taking your attention away from God, then they've won. Because they can try to destroy the Jewish body, but the only way they can destroy the Jewish soul is if we let them. Would the music team please come up? Would you please stand and join me in prayer? Adon Olam, master of the universe. Lord, we thank you for your word that you give us. Lord, your written word, and your spoken word. We thank you for the faith that you place in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the stories of our ancestors. We thank you for this festival day that you use to show the miraculous, the wonderful salvation that you bring upon your people and the whole world through Messiah Yeshua, your son. Lord, we thank you for the many wonderful stories that you give us to illustrate the awe that we live in when we truly recognize what you have done for us. Lord, we thank you for this festival. We thank you for the joy that you place in our hearts. And I ask that whenever the enemy comes up, you would give us the strength and the understanding to keep our focus on you, on your love, on your promises. For it is you who are King of King and Lord of Lords. Amen. Hag Sameach.